Hey guys, welcome back to Admix for another episode of Giving the Game Away. And today uh, we do a bit of a special episode where we're going to talk about the pioneers of in-game advertising. And I'm joined by Miki Torod from Perp Game. How are you doing? Hi. I'm good, I'm good. How are you? Very well, very well. Um, I'm super excited to, uh, to have this chat with you. You have a, a really exciting background and this is really going to take us back um, quite a few years and discuss the uh, the early uh, early years of in-game advertising. Um, that's, a, that's a nice um, way of saying I should retire. I'm getting old. <laughs> that's not what I said. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it, it's quite interesting overall because you know, um, in our company, obviously, we are doing AdMix is doing in-game ads in a, in a slightly different way. But it's it's always good to see that the concept of it of putting ads in game is not groundbreaking it's not new um and it's really interesting to see how that model actually evolved over time so really excited to hear um you know how, how what um what your you guys were doing back in the day so before we get started um it would be great if you could just give us a, a little bit of an intro about yourself and also perp game um and you know how you got into the the, the gaming industry yeah perp games has been going for about um, five years now, we um, publish um, video games. We focus on the physical box, although we do do a little bit of digital pu publishing, but we focus on the physical box. We, we believe very strongly that um, people still still want boxes. We, we, we certainly wouldn't say to people, you've got to have a box instead of a digital, but conversely, we don't like people being told you can only have digital, not a box. So we're kind of pioneers, of, not pioneers, but we're, sorry, we're, we're kind of keeping alive, keeping the flame alive. The kind of box publishing we focus very um, much some of the experience you can have in vr gaming is unlike any other experience i've ever had since um, i started working in gaming in 1995 but starting playing games with me me spectrum and my friends commodore way back in the in the 80s so um you know things like and, and, you know, i don't know how fair you are with, with vr games as such but games like ghost giants and, mm. and things like moss these are games where or even Vader Immortal, where the first time you see um, Darth Vader, these are games where emotions go to a level that you know I've never experienced before. So the other thing is that in VR gaming, a lot of it is currently driven um, by indie studios, and there's a really good dynamic and, and vibrancy in those indie studios. And they don't necessarily have the size and the resources to put games in box themselves. So we feel that we provide added value. And I think hopefully today when we talk about advertising in games one of the big things that that i believe in on, on anything in life whether it's being a father a husband a friend or an employee or employer it's, it's added value um and you know i think from from perp games point of view we bring out a value to retailers to allow them to sell boxes from developers to get additional revenue streams in a very tough vr market and for the end user to be able to have that choice between digital or physical yeah that makes sense um sounds great so how um if we go back uh, now a few years um you have a really interesting background working for some some really great great companies mm -hmm. um and it looks like it all started at micro time right that's what i'm seeing on your profile here so can you explain a bit more about micro time how you how you got that job in the first place your first job um and yeah what was the, the background information there yeah so um i i went to university at newcastle i studied a business administration course, so a BA in business admin, which was short for BABA, which was a, um, a fun little name for it. Um, but you know, when, when I came down to London after finishing the course, my brother lived in London, he lived with some friends, and, and it allowed me the opportunity to, I guess, sleep on his floor, if you like, and his friends were really nice people, and they, they allowed me to stay there, which gave me the opportunity to go to um, Microtime Media, which I knew about because they were pioneers, they were the first agency to put video games and put advertising, sorry, into video games. So I'd read about them and was, was very excited because my degree covered advertising and that's kind of where I wanted to go. But I was a gamer, as I mentioned before, you know, I, I Spectrum and then by that point, I'd moved into the Sega ecosystem with Master and Mega Drives and things. Um, so this opportunity was great. So I actually just went to them and I just said, right, can you give me a job? I don't want any money. Um, I work for three months. At the end of three months, if I've added value, then keep me on if I haven't goodbye and it was you know it was my mindset plus the fact that because life isn't just a mindset you've got to have luck with it I, I had a brother and his friends that allowed me to kind of live on the floor so um, in, in the house and, and survive for three months without any money but again it's about added value it's about me going somewhere 
with what I believe I could offer and saying to someone, the value to you and employing me is it'll cost you nothing but a, a seat in your company and I will show you what I can do. Um, and that's how I got the job. And, you know, as, as you kindly mentioned, I've worked for some big, huge companies since then. It's all because of that one decision um, of going there and, and offering my services for nothing. Wow. And so what, what were you actually doing there? Like how, give me a, a you know, overview. How, how big yeah. of a company was it? What, what were they doing? What was your job there for the first couple of years? Well, it's very hard to say a job because when you work in a company that at that point had five or six people, it grew to being a right. 25 plus person, you know, and you're kind of pioneers. You're kind of always doing everything. Technically, my job was to um, phone up and contact advertisers, find out and convince them that they should be, you know, find out what budget or campaigns they're running and convince them they should be going into video games. And then finding the relevant video game for them um, and that, that's kind of what we did all of us did a, a similar thing there was slightly different roles the md obviously had more kind of hr and financial responsibilities because it was his company but aside from that we were all trying to win business and we were all trying to find the perfect vehicle i.e the perfect game for the brands that were interested in being involved and so that was kind of the day a, a lot of it was was you know, going through old books like Alf and Lena, which were these big, thick books that used to list all the brands and all the brand managers at each company, you know, and going through and finding a reason to phone them up and trying to convince them or talking to their media agencies and trying to get them on the media schedule and the buying schedule of, of where media agencies spent their money. You know, is video games a, a viable option to spend money as well as this magazine, that magazine and that TV show? And that was our job to convince them. So we all did the same thing, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like things haven't changed that much because that's to some extent what we're doing as well with with some yeah. differences, of course, in the setup. Um, and so, what 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 was the the technology that was involved there? Was it purely a more of an agency model? Like, how would you how would you actually go and and integrate the ads within the within the content? Well, things moved on. So, uh, MicroTime had a number of different stages to it. So, uh, for the sake of of this first part we'll, we'll discuss stage one and that was really all about um putting brands into a game and we were in that sense as you kind of touched on the agency model so for example things like fizzy chew it, um went into a game called snapperazzi adidas went into a game called power soccer mars bar went into bike and rice from mars chubba chups lollies went into zool um penguin biscuits went into james pond robocop 2 um so it was about getting the assets from the advertiser once you've convinced them to be in understand what they want to achieve and then talk to a number of different developers and see which one offered the best vehicle a, a great example is that, that i mentioned penguin biscuits james james pond was you know um a, a brand that, that people have played it was a game that had existed before and done well it was onto its second iteration and in this particular version the game was set in the arctic um, and penguins, if I remember rightly, oh, it's taking my mind back a bit, but penguins were stolen by some kind of Dr. Evil, just like all platform games, you know, Dr. Robotics makes all the rabbits turn into metal creatures. It was a similar type of thing. Some Dr. Evil had stolen penguins. And so it made sense from, from an initial point of view to have penguin biscuits as part of, of the branding. But then all you're doing is, is product placement if it's just a penguin biscuit logo at the beginning. So added value, what I said before, what we, we talked to the developers, and these guys were quite happy to integrate Penguin Biscuits in a bigger part of the game. So within actual James Pond um, Robocop 2, James Pond 2 Robocop, uh, Robocod, there's a secret Penguin Biscuits level. Um, so that adds value to the user because there's an extra level in the game that wouldn't have ex existed if it wasn't for this yeah. relationship. And it adds value to the brand because in that level, you get to see a kind of a side on of a Penguin Biscuit that's kind of blown up. Um, I should have bought a penguin biscuit to show you because then I could have ate it after this, um, which would be nice. But the, the biscuit itself has got a lot of air bubbles in it, and that's part of its kind of USP. As you snap it, it crunches as the biscuit kind of the air bubbles react as you, as you, you break it. And so the, the in-game level involves you jumping around on these little kind of um, gaps in between the biscuit, um, which really showed the brand proposition. Um, and then obviously the developers got this extra level in their game as well um, and marketing support. Um, so everyone kind of gained from that because it was fully integrated. It wasn't just a, a hoarding that was just there for the sake of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you would basically work with the developer to kind of create that 
bespoke level and um, whatever the brand was paying would cover that cost and more, right? In terms of business model, is that roughly how it worked? Absolutely. Sorry, I'm just turning my outlook off because you might have heard a couple of um, little beats no there, emails coming through. Um, yes, that, that's exactly how it worked. The advertiser paid us a revenue. We were, as a company, very much at the beginning, a media-led company. Our owner, um, Daniel Bobroff, was a media planner from Young and Rubicon at the beginning, um, before we start this up. So he was very much media-led. And I, I, I don't know if it, well, you probably don't because your age is much younger than me, me but round about that time, there was, a, there was a lot of debate in the industry, not the gaming industry, but the kind of wider media industry of, you know, what's more important? Is it media? Is it creative? And a lot of media agencies split from bigger, um, huge kind of all-encompassing agencies to, to form their own specialist areas. Um, we kind of tried to straddle that. We tried to say, well, actually, media is incredibly important um, and it's, it's probably the most important thing. But... With video games, that allows a hidden extra, and that hidden extra is interactivity. And you've got to remember at this time, it's before the internet, well, it's not before the internet, obviously, but before brands were involved, um, you know, in the early 90s and heavily marketing themselves through internet and, very, and various other interactive um, ways. So this was the first time we could say, and that Penguin Biscuit is a great example, it's the first time you could say, well, actually, you know, media is very, very important, and creativity is very, very important. And in video games, you've got that perfect blend of two. You've got this media, which is, you know, consumed with such a passion by this age group, far more than anything else they consume, far more, more passionate than watching television or, or reading a, a magazine or a newspaper or whatever it would be. But you could have your brands actually mean something. You know, Adidas, let's see if I can dig this one up. Um, I don't even see that. Yeah. No, we did Adidas Power Soccer with Sony Cygnosis, or Cygnosis at the time it became Sony Cygnosis, apologies. It was Cygnosis at the time. Um, and Adidas, you know, it became the, the header of the game. So it was, their name was, was part of the game. It was Adidas Power Soccer instead of Power Soccer. So, you know, the developer right. game because they had this huge brand. But, but actually Adidas were pushing at that time their Predator Soccer boot, which was developed by Craig Johnson, an Australian chap who used to play for Liverpool, who developed a new kind of um, fronting for a boot that allows for 10% more swerve and power. So we integrated in the game in a hidden kind of button control press, the Adidas Predator Soccer Move, which allowed your shot to have 10% more power, 10% more mm. sweep. The brand was actually becoming part of the game. It wasn't yeah. the case just having Adidas hoardings around the side of the game, or if, you know, in the idle mode, it would run a video. I mean, all those things kind of happened, but you actually had the ability to wear the Predator boot and play the game with 10% more swerve and 10% more power if you knew the hidden move. So there was a kind of a, a big added value for, for players to learn that hidden move and be able to pull off the move and get the, the, the goal or, or the, extra, mm. the, the advantages that it would be. And then there'd be a little kind of predator reward kind of logo come up, but it wouldn't stop the game. You wouldn't have to sit through an advert at that point. It would just be a little kind of, I, I can't exactly remember what it was, but I imagine it was the boot with some flames behind it and the kind of a predator shot type thing happening. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, so that was roughly 1995, right? You said around yeah, that time. Yeah, Adidas Power Soccer thing. I've got, I've got a couple here. You know, you know there was Adidas Power Soccer 2, um, International 97, and then there was 98. So that relationship went from um, the World Cup, which I think was in America in 94, all the way through to 98. Um, so it went a long time. And it was a very successful relationship because Cygnosis got... Um, a lot of branding opportunities. You know, I think it was, um, I might be totally wrong here, but I think Marcel Desai was the front of the box for um, 98. Um, so again, you've got these famous people from, you know, Adidas sponsored sports stars who were becoming the front of the box, but Synosis weren't paying for that because that was mm. part of the promotional deal from Adidas. We were kind of in the middle getting paid by Adidas. And, and you know, so we got our money as well as a kind of a, a media agency relationship and Cygnosis got a good relationship and from Adidas's point of view they got a great relationship because a they could show the interaction or interactivity of their brand but possibly more important than that by becoming Adidas Power Soccer they started to get an ownership and yeah. this is where we come into uh, I didn't plan this actually but it's a really nice segue into your question about the models and how I said it was it was different models. This, this seg segues into how Microtime developed. It developed from being a, a media agency to something that was more um, focused on ownership. Um, so by that, I kind of mean that 
we actually took over um and, and to be fair i don't know what the the the, the business model was whether we merged or we bought them out I, I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure but a, a company called arcane i think it was arcane entertainment um, who were a developing development company and so microsign suddenly had a development arm and started making bespoke games for developers now there had been in the past long before microtime existed or, or long before i was ever um out of out of school or university a lot of well I'll say a lot five or six games brands that made kind of promotional things i know that coca-cola in the early early 80s i think did um did a game for a, a trade show, which I think Atari made actually, which was just taking Space Invaders and putting, I think it was Pepsi cans mm. actually, throwing Coca-Cola cans, destroying Pepsi cans. I don't know the exact detail, but it was just for a trade show. That was its purpose. Yeah. Um, Pepsi did stuff, McDonald's did stuff, Domino's Pizza did stuff, but they were all small sales promotional things. They weren't revenue generating things. <clears throat> we, you know, we worked um, with Pepper Army the, um, you know, the, the spicy sausage. And we created a game called Animal, which was um, published by Ocean um, Software. They were our publisher, but we were then not a, a media agency. We were a developer. So our revenue, um, it, it was um, um, Pepper Army that, that paid for it. They paid for the development. We're talking six figures. They paid for the development of the video game. Now that video game allowed, you know, it's, it's Aid Edmondson, who was the voice of the TV adverts. He was the voice of the in-game sausage. It was Pepper Army. And, and again, I don't know if you remember how their branding went in the 90s, but it was very kind of humorous and crazy and violent. And the sausage running around on TV adverts, destroying things. Um, and, you know, the ad, the game was was kind of a similar type of thing. So it, from, from Pepper Army's point of view, um, the game allowed their brand to come to life. Yes, they paid for it but mm. we're also selling it. So the model suddenly becomes advertising that becomes self-efficient um, in terms of regaining that advertising spend yeah. to spend later. And as long as the games were successful, technically this could go on forever. Every two years, a new um, Pepper, Army, Pepper Army campaign could have its own video game. And apart from that initial investment, the second game is paid for from the first one and the third one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so forth and on it goes. So the company developed into a, 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 a you know a studio that could create content, and therefore a lot of other things happened. You know, we've got here, and again, I don't know if you can see that well, but we did things with Ford for the Ford Fiesta in 1995 um, for their new Ford Fiesta, and this was just simply a pester power thing. It was um, this wasn't sold; it was given away. Anyone that it was a family car that the Ford Fiesta, anyone that that came to the showrooms and drove the car. Um, for a test drive, they were given the free game. And, you know, so kids, you know, kids, you know, I'm not naive, kids wouldn't know about it and say to their dad, come on, let's go to the Ford showroom and drive the Fiesta. But if they were looking for a car as a family and the kids yeah. saw this promotion, just one more reason, yeah. Then they would say, oh, you've got to, you've got to drive the Fiesta. Now, you know, we're not saying that, drive, that playing that video game would make them buy the car, but the brand manager at, at Ford was so confident that if they got family into the seat of the car and driving it then they would buy the car because they would see the i can't remember exactly what it was but they had 16 benefits that the game had to convey um that was their big kind of push and then the, the person you know test driving the car would see those benefits and then they would go off and have more chance of buying the car and it was the game that got the family into the car in the first place because the kids saw the pos buy the car in the, yeah. the show or whatever so you know we've developed as a model um, to do all sorts of different different things, but the whole idea was moving from a media-led um, to an ownership-led model, so advertisers could have ownership. And there was a reason for doing that. I've kind of gone a little bit off of piece, but there, there was a reason for doing that. And the main reason, oh, well, there was a revenue reason, of course, and there was a you know to help micro time grow reason. But when you looked at, at, at some of the things that were going on and the dynamics that you had to face. When you're talking to a brand manager, you know, if you take that earlier question of, of what was our jobs, what was our roles, you know, you phone up a brand manager, and if you're lucky, you manage to get through it. It's hard to get through to these guys. They're, they're well kind of, um, um, you know, kept away so they could, from, from just mm. general nonsense calls so that they can, they can do their job. But if you finally manage to get to someone who can make a decision, you know, they are focused on the campaign in front of them. They're focused on not making a mistake. 
because they yeah. want to be the group marketing manager or the senior brand manager or whatever. And they've got two years in a brand manager role until their promotion type of thing. So they don't want to make a mistake. And there, therein lies a whole load of problems that we faced as a company. Because if you're, if you're a brand manager, first of all, you're looking at something in the next six months. Your creative is probably going to be ready about a week before it's got to be submitted to the various bodies, before it can become a, an official TV advert or before it has to go to the magazines. So your creative is usually done just in time. You're working on a campaign that's, you know, about six months you know, away. Um, but if you're going in, you've got me phoning you up saying, yeah, yeah, we need the creative about eight months before so it gets integrated into the game. Um, we can't guarantee if the game is going to be a success, so we can't give you media numbers. Um, etc etc you know mm. and it doesn't work for them it's a gamble it's a risk it's going to cost them money and you know they may in their heart know that it's a cool thing to do and believe me when i say look i can't give you the same level of um media numbers and, and we did actually give media numbers we worked things out between you know how long somebody would be playing how many people would watch the game um, and, and all other kind of relationships like that, how long the game would last before we moved on to the next game. So we did have media numbers, but they weren't as detailed as people, you know, if, if you were trying to sell TV or whatever it would be. So yeah. that, that brand manager may love the idea, but he knows if it goes wrong, he's going to, you know, his, his career is over. Whereas if he put his money in television and print and it goes wrong, his career is not over because that's what his boss wants him to yeah, do. Yeah. Anyway. So, and that, yeah. hasn't, that hasn't changed much today. No. We're, we're facing the same same kind of, you know, it's it's not business as usual. It's probably more in the mainstream and more and more over the past few years. But it's still, it's not it's not traditional media. It's not banner. It's not video. Um, mm. And so, what was the pitch then that that you were using to to convince these these advertisers? Yeah, well, this is the point. It, it, it's ownership. It's it's trying. It was trying to take the decision and trying to take um, the the budget, where the budget sits within the company. It was trying to take that away from the campaign because, you know, for you guys, it's slightly different because you're working with dynamic advertising. This was before dynamic advertising. Yeah. So if something was linked to a campaign, we had those problems that I mentioned earlier, you know, also campaigns last for a period of time and then, you know, advertisers like to move on. They don't yeah. like the idea that someone can go and buy, you know, um, you know, Zool and see the old branding for Chupa Chups two years later. They don't like that. But if you move the, the, the people you're talking to and you're trying to move the conversation away from a brand campaign and more to IP building and ownership, sure. then it becomes different. You know, Adidas knew as part of their, you know, yearly look at the various kind of, it was all football or soccer that we dealt with Adidas. So it was based around the themes of the World Cups, the Euro Championships, the, the European Cups. So they knew that, they were having brand campaigns at those moments. Now, whether it was going to be the Predator boot at that point or it was going to be something else was kind of irrelevant. They were building in with us timelines to have Adidas Power Soccer 97, Adidas Power Soccer 98. Um, that was always going to happen. So they were looking at it from a brand point of view. Um, so moving things to a brand point of view and ownership was a way around it. The other way around it, we talked a little bit about Fiesta and, and Ford Fiesta and, and the Pepper Army game. Um, the other way around it was us developing content um, because, you know, there's another great example here, which is, um, I don't know if you can see the little guy there, the little kinder guy. Mm. So you could, you could move things to a brand perspective, like the Adidas example, or you could move things to a sales promotional perspective. Now, Kinder at the time, this would have been about 1996, they have their, 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 their themes, um, you know, their little eggs have different themes each, each period. And on this particular occasion in September 1990, actually, I think it was September 1997, might have been 98, actually, in my memory. Um, but anyway, their theme were what, were what were called the Pira Meows. They were little cats that were based around Egyptian um, mythology and history. So you opened your Kinder Egg, you ate the chocolate, you opened it up and you got one of eight or nine different Pyramiao cats. Now, at that same time, their exact target audience around the September, October time in the UK, by part of the national curriculum, was studying Egyptian history. So 
the idea here from a sales point of promotion point of view, and because we had the development studio in place, and that was the key thing, if we didn't, we couldn't have turned this around so quickly, we could pitch to Kinder and say, well, why don't we make your little Kinder man as a kind of a Howard Carter character, um, and he can lead you through um, a, an interactive game on the computer where you kind of um, explore Tutankhamun's tomb. But within mm. there, there's seven or eight different activities for kids. This gets manufactured and sent to every single school in, in Britain. Um, and with it, let's open it up. There's probably dead spiders in here. I haven't opened this up for you. Okay, so here we go. So you've got the, the game, but you've also got um, all the instructions. And you've got a, a kind of a, a map of of the different areas of Tutankhamun. Again, I don't know if you can see that, but of Tutankhamun. Mm -hmm. yep. And each area um, was, was beautifully modeled. It was point and click. And each area was beautifully modeled. And each area had an activity to do. So for example, there might be some hieroglyphics on the on the wall. And if you click on them, it might be just a kind of a, you know, that, that kind of typical image of um, the Nile with the kind of lines coming up, the estuaries leading towards the Mediterranean. It might be a, a, an image of that, and then you click on it, and then you'll see the water overflow the estuaries, and then you'll see, um, you know, how the how the the, the plants, um, oh, sorry, how the, the crops were, were kind of grown, etc., with irrigation, um, and all of those incredible skills that the Egyptians learned. And basically, the idea was um, every, you know, not every, not in, in those days, kids didn't have computers at schools, but the teachers did. So the kids would would go around the, the teacher's computer. The teacher would have printable notes that came out with this that. that a, told them how to use it, but B, had the answers to questions and, and all the different kind of notes. And, and I actually did that with teachers. I, I went to meet um, head teachers and, and um, senior um, people in, in, in schools and, and wrote um, scripts and stories and games that would fit in with the national curriculum. And it was an incredible success, you know, because what it did was it allowed um, Kinder and Ferrero um, to go into schools and put their brand in front of kids without breaking any laws um, in a yeah. way that we've never been able to do before. But that was all about ownership. So it all comes back to ownership. Um, and that was the key thing for us. It was, as I say, it was before dynamic advertising. So it was all about giving advertisers an opportunity to own something um, or have some part of ownership. And that took the argument or the discussion away from brand managers and short-term campaign objectives. Mm -hmm. And in terms of pricing as well, I guess, in terms of just um obviously at the time i assumed that it was pretty hard to track how many people would you know play the game or see the brand uh you could probably estimate the number of um yeah the, the, based on the distribution and how many of these units would be sold but i guess by moving into ownership you would be able to charge a, a full package that was maybe less dependent on the actual success but more more charging on a, almost like a project yeah you're absolutely correct i mean when you when you yeah when you think that um um, you know, when you if, if you're selling something like a branding at the time, um, you know, you, you've got to somehow give some kind of reach um, mm. investment. So as I say, we we looked at you know number of people who will buy the game, number of people. You know, if it was a football game, you know, maybe you could sell X amount of thousand. Four people would be sitting around watching it at people's houses. Because again, in those days before. Right, right. Online gaming, you'd go around to people's houses to play kickoff or sensible soccer or whatever you'd be playing. Um, so we could make correlations. You know, the game would be played this many times a week. This many people on average would watch it, and it would live in the house and be played and relevant for three months, and etc. But after the point, what happens if it doesn't hit those numbers? There's the big problem because in yeah. institutional advertising, you know, and, and you guys. You know, you've got it kind of nailed in in-game advertising and dynamic advertising because the advert just keeps running, right? You, yeah, eventually... and we can track literally everything. Whereas yeah. for you, it was it was more of a of a static thing, and I guess it was it was pretty big risk if you were to price it this way for for the brand. And so I totally understand why you you went the other way. Risk is the huge word because yeah. again, if, if the game failed, then you've got to still deliver. So suddenly you've got to go to another game and say, oh yeah, can can you? Put that in, but we haven't got any money anymore because mm. we're all integrated into the first game. So how it, it, it's very difficult to get around those problems. Um, yeah. And you know, we, we still did it, and, and we still did integrate games into brands um, well after we had our own development studio. But we did. It, it was a, it was a, it was a change. It, you know, it was a change deliberately to kind of 
um, get around some of the issues that we faced. Yeah, yeah. Great. So we talked about the, the advertiser side and, and that makes a lot of sense. I'm actually really surprised that, you know, even in the 90s, um, I know it was not that long ago, but, but that advertisers were already forward thinking and, and embracing this channel. Um, but what about the publishers? What was the what was the pitch for the for the game publishers aside from the from the money? Obviously, um, <clears throat> was there anything else to to convince them? Were, were you also facing rejections from publishers who didn't like the idea of integrating advertisers within the game? How did that side of the marketplace work? Yeah, I mean, I, I might be looking at it with rose tinted glasses, so I, I may get this slightly wrong, and there might be some. Um, developers or, or publishers from the past who, who, who watch this and go, whoa, that, that didn't happen. But my recollection is that it was the advertisers that was the hard part of it. Um, mm -hmm. finding, finding a game wasn't the hardest part because A, there was a lot of games, but B, it's a similar thing today with, you know, we're, we're a publisher and, and you know, we, we've got to work with developers to convince them to, to use us and we've got to add value to them and, and tell what, what they're getting. And nine times out of 10, what most people want, especially within the indie world, which as we talked about earlier, we, we kind of embrace and the VR indie world. Um, it's, it's support marketing. It's kind of, you know, understanding and help in, in that area. And that's always been the case. You know, how do you get people to hear about or know about your game? And if you're talking about a world of the early 90s where there is no social media, how does that happen without having to pay massive amounts of money or, you know, um, God forbid, um, bribe some magazine to give you a high score that may or may not have happened in those days. And I'm saying nothing. But, you know, how do you do it? So someone like us coming to, to developers, it was a godsend. It was kind of like, oh, yeah. By the way, you know, Synosis, we're going to bring you Adidas and we'll bring you, you know, as part of the contract, three um, Adidas um, sportsmen to promote your game, whether it's at events or the front of box. Um, you could have X amount of footballs to give away, strips, whatever it would be. Um, it's suddenly like, oh, wow, this has changed things a little bit for me because now I've got another route. Um, you know, it, it was very rare that you got the perfect store. And I won't lie. It was very rare that you got the position mm. where, you know, you know, where you know, penguin biscuits would have on their you know, six pack of penguin biscuits, you know, collect two of these wrappers and win a copy of um, you know, James Pond. It was very rare that that would happen. And that's all about timings, which is timings, as we talked about earlier, just were all over the place in terms of integrating something in a game and the way brand managers worked. It just did not sync. So you didn't really get that, but you still did get some forms of support, even if it was just a case of getting... Um, a job load of penguin biscuits that were sent to reviewers. Um, you know, every little thing is better than nothing, right? So developers weren't too upset. They could either get you know, money, money and promotional support or just promotional support, depending what it was. There were, there were some deals where the, the revenue from the, ad, from the advertiser was so low, but they could offer so much promotional support that the pitch to yeah. the developers was, well, there is no revenue because we can't give you money else we can't exist because there's just enough to pay for us. So... This is, if you want to be in, you'll get this level of promotional support. And by and large, as far as I remember, developers liked it. If you, if you take, for example, we put um, in Theme Park, and so we can talk about really big um, publishers and developers, Bullfrog Games and Electronic Arts. You know, there was a Midland um, Bank couch at the start of Theme Park. Now that couch, again, I don't know if you remember way back in the early 90s, but was using their TV adverts and was part of their kind of... Um, branding a big blue couch with a yellow kind of logo on and stuff so just in the intro at the very beginning when the family run in and jump on the couch as it were um you know they, they jump on the midland bank couch and it, it's you know it's, it's no more than that um but theme park is a game about financial management um and mm -hmm. needing at the right times to lend money or to have a bank that's favorable to you and helping you out and that little association was just enough for a bullfrog to think you know what that's nice. That is just nice. That ends. That adds a real world, um, real world element to what is it's, they 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 wanted to be and was at the time a real world simulation. It was kiddies graphics. Yeah. Obviously, that's what it was, and it was a fun game. So it had gaming elements, but it was essentially a real world simulation um, uh, of a theme park. So, mm. you know, so developers, I don't think you know, developers for us was never the problem, right? <clears throat> That's interesting because at the time, mo the business model for games was most likely selling the game up front. And so you guys were probably one of the first one to um, start to create a new revenue stream 
for for game developers, which was which was advertising at the time, and so. So, yeah, I'm, it, it, I'm, it, it's funny. Sorry, I was, I was just going to say that the, the, the way, I, I won't lie and say we we're the first ever to put adverts in games. I mean, very famously, I think Adventure Time was the very first in the seventies that put a, an advert for their next game. But that was their game, you know. Exactly. Daily, yeah, not bringing the, the world of brands, and the world yeah, of the advertising world, into it. Daily Thompson yeah. um, Decathlon game um, in the early eighties that had, or, or late eighties, that had branding for Ocean in there. Um, so there was branding, but Ocean was their publisher. So again, it was not a paid for um, typical media relationship. And indeed, there's, there's a very famous game called Tapper, which was a, um, a coin-op game. It was an arcade game um, as opposed to a home computer game. And the developers actually put Budweiser all in the game. It was a game about being a barman. Um, and the side of the, the, the machine, the side of the arcade cabinet had Budweiser logos on and in game, there was Budweiser logos behind the bar and everything. But that was done um, as a way to get, it was it was quite a clever thought process from the developers because it was a way to get the arcade cabinet into pubs and bars as opposed to in arcades. So they were trying to open up their audience, these huge amounts of bars and, you know, and Hauser Bush kind of sponsored bars all across America. Um, but it wasn't paid for, they just asked, you know, and Hauser Bush if, and the Budweiser brand, ma brand managers if they could do it and they thought, yeah, cool, why not? Um, and so this was, so, so we were the first to do it from a, a, a selling advertising space. Yeah. And so I guess this is also one of the first times where gamers would see brands in games. So what were the reactions of the gaming community? What did they think of it? Yeah, again, this was before social media. So, you know, we weren't flooded by um, people <laughs> attacking our, our Twitter social comments. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, how, how would they get in touch with us? How would we know? I guess we would know through press. We would know from them contacting the developers with letters and contacting us with letters. And as oh, far probably as the know, sales of the next game as well, right? You probably so could, could see that in the results. Yeah. And as far as I know, nothing was negative. We never got any letters. As far as I know, no developers ever got any letters. The sales of the games were never were affected. And I think it was different, though, because I think in those days, because it was so rare, I mean, you've got to remember that, it, you know, Microtime were pioneers, but we probably only did about 15 or so campaigns, maybe a few more, I don't know. And when you consider all the amount of games in that, that stretch of years, most of them didn't have things in it. Um, yeah. So to see something in it was actually at that point, a little bit of an added bonus. If you found the secret Adidas Easter Power egg. Coffee yeah. Move, yeah. or if you found that the the, 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 the the room in in James Pond, the penguin biscuit, or whatever it would be, there's there was some kind of you know, oh that's really cool. That is mm. really, really cool about it. And I think I think I don't know, we never interviewed people, we don't know, but my feeling is most people enjoyed it because it was a rarity. And back to that original point, we always tried, didn't always succeed. But we always tried to add value all the way across the chain. We always yeah. tried to make sure the developers gain, the advertisers gain, because we need new custom. And the consumers either found it funny or, or got a new level to play with or got a new in-game tool or toy to play with. So that, that, that fitted perfectly with the, the game. So we yeah. always tried to add value. So Certainly different from the, the interstitial ads and all the ads that you would see today on the on the on the traditional uh, traditional advertising on mobile games certainly different yeah, from that it is but uh, to be fair you know you, you've got to kind of look i think when you address this question if you start getting to quite um areas that the people are very passionate about th there is there is something different between um you know where history and your experience tells you that this is allowed to something that suddenly appears so when it comes to mobile gaming, when the mobile game shifted from um, paid for to predominantly free, it was relatively mm. new. And therefore, I don't have a problem with even the most awkward and intrusive adverts being in something that's free to play. Because, you know, that's it, it's no different to a soap opera model from the, the 60s, I think it was maybe in the 50s, where the big soap giants paid for television programming. Now that programming wouldn't have existed. Those Coronation Streets that people sat down and really enjoyed and added value to their life wouldn't have happened without the advertiser. So yeah. that's the same for me in the free to play model. There's a similar type of thing going on. However, if you take the, the whole TV thing or the, or the video thing, you know, in, in, in soap operas and thing, things like that, um, that, that's all fine. But, you know, if I, if I went to the shop and when I buy a DVD, 
you know, nowadays, maybe more digital, but when I used to buy a DVD, to have unskippable adverts at the beginning. Now, that's not really acceptable to me because I know from experience that I have bought video cassettes in the past, you know, and, and DVDs and CDs in the past and, and things that didn't have those adverts in. So I know that the model that the publishers and the developers and the content creators have from a revenue stream doesn't need those advertisers. So why yeah. are those advertisers in something I paid for? That's yeah. the it starts to get a dangerous game. You know, if you, can, if you can add value to something someone's paid for, that's fine. Um, if you don't add value, then the person can't have paid for it or historically, you know, they've got to have no experience in paying for it. Again, if you look at glossy magazines, you know, not every advert in a glossy magazine is good or adds value. I wouldn't say that. But there is a, a cognitive knowledge of everyone reading that glossy magazine that the cost of that magazine um, that you pay for it does not cover the price of the, the, the cost of paper. paper. Yeah. Even, the cost of paper, even the cost of yeah. getting people flying out to, to visit people, interview people, do all those stories. So you know you have to experience an advert on every fourth or fifth page to enjoy that quality. And you can accept that even though you've paid for it. So it's not just about paying for stuff. It's about an understanding, which is usually based on your history of interacting with that particular model as to yeah. whether you believe that. And, and that's, that's a big problem because when things start coming into something that someone's paid $30, $40 for, there needs to be a bloody good reason why. Most people for sure, yeah. That. It's about the value exchange and what, what you're you know, giving in exchange for it. If you, as you said, if the, if the game is free, um, you know, it's uh, it's kind of a, a almost like a social contract to to accept advertising, yeah. but it doesn't mean that it's always been done right. And there's a lot of abuse um, yeah. with the way that data is handled and all of that stuff, which is a which is a separate discussion. But just to um, before we finish off, so um, what eventually happened to to micro time? What do you think were the the key limitations um, for for that model? It was, it was a very difficult, difficult model. And what actually happened to MicroTime, um, it, it ended, and it, it, you know, it, it, but it, it didn't end in a particularly, well, it ended in a bad way because everything ends in a bad way, but it didn't end in a failure from an advertising point of view. The, 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 the general kind of trend that we talked about from being a media agency to a studio owner who was trying to um, give ownership to brands, then by definition became a video game developer. Um, the name changed to Dabus. They released a number of games under, I think the most famous was the Motocross Mania, if I remember rightly. I had left by then. Um, I had gone to Ubisoft, but um, yeah, I think Motocross Mania, and if, if I remember rightly, because um, I still knew the guys really well and the people at the team, that got to number one in, in the States and as a franchise sold over a million units. So they did very well as a developer. Now they still put advertising in the game, but it Put changed. Themselves. Yeah. Change. yeah, they were now a fully fledged developer looking for publishers, making their own games, their own IP. And as a lot of developers over time, it, it, you know, they, they didn't make enough money to survive and, and life moves on. But it, it didn't. I, I have a lot of pride looking back on it and how tough it was. And there were times where, you know, if, if you didn't bring in, bring in something. I remember a couple of times where if we didn't bring in something by a certain period, then there was going to be you know, redundancies and problems for the company surviving. And I remember surviving on the skin of our teeth on, on one particular occasion with one particular project that we managed to pull over the line. But it does give me a lot of pride that MicroTime as an, a media agency, an in-game advertising specialist, and then a content creator for advertisers never failed. Uh, Absolutely. Provide as a development, which a lot of developers do, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, if you look fast forward to now, what do you think? Um, uh, what do you think has changed? Obviously, the the gaming industry has been transformed many times over, and it's, it's very different. Uh, it's a lot larger. Many more mm -hmm. people are playing games. What do you think um, makes it different? And what do you think? Um, now could be a, a better time for, for in-game advertising? Ooh, great question. Have we got five hours? Um, <laughs> I, th I think there's a number of things. I think, first of all, um, um, people, your, likes of yourself. You know, I, I, I know you, I know what you guys do. I know how much attention to detail you, you pay in terms of the added value kind of um, contract, if you like, to the end user and, and making sure that everything is correct. And I think there's, there's, a, there's a big understanding of that. I don't think many people, well, some will, but the likes of yourself and the people who are really professionally taking this forward. You know, if you looked at a, 
you know, if you just take a fictitious, oh, let's think of something, eek, um, a sports game, a winter sports game. You know, if it's a sim game, um, if it's a sim winter sports game, then the developer could have an après ski section to it and bars. And if that's the case, then, you know, you guys could talk to them about having um, what would be um, advertising opportunities within those bars, whether it's on kind of TV screens in, the, in there or, or posters walking to the bar in this particular Sims game. And that would add value. It would, it would work and make sense. But if it was a, an extreme sports game, you know, you guys wouldn't be saying to them, to developers, oh, by the way, can you kind of um, force in an area where someone has to eat food, maybe to get extra health or something, so we can put those boards there? That's, I think, a big difference. I think there's a lot more professional people now looking at it from a consumer added value point of view and saying, no, 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 I might be able to sell that, but I'm not going to sell that. Because yeah. I'm not but I will sell this because this adds value. So there's that part. And then there's the, the development from technology. Um, you know, we've touched on dynamic advertising and dynamic advertising allows a lot of opportunities. Again, as long as it's done professionally and correctly, you wouldn't want to see beautiful billboards and interactive kind of Times Square style environments in a war-torn kind of halo universe because it wouldn't yeah. make sense. They would have been blown up ages ago, you know, by the you know, relevant is key yeah, yeah. for sure if you're a if you're a soldier you don't want light shining on you you would have blown up yourself so they wouldn't exist but if it's in a, a modern day or a futuristic um, um city center then they exist and they make sense and they add a value <clears throat> then you've got to look at the difference in, in people's gaming habits and that's sometimes technologically driven and sometimes not so vr for example offers a more immersive gaming experience than there's ever been. And your view is not just in front of you now, it's all around you. So there are tremendous opportunities there for people that doesn't interfere with gameplay. Um, Esports suddenly gives you an opportunity of an audience that are in a game, in spectator mode, watching a game, but not playing the game. So suddenly opportunities to interact with those guys, adding value to them, but not putting them off their gameplay experience, is there, you know, in esports, there's gaps between games. Now those gaps between games, that's, to me, if you're in a spectator mode, is there really a difference between that and watching a TV show where there's a 15 minute, ad, uh, sorry, five minute ad break in between, mm. you know, a, a, a half time in a football match, there's an ad break. I can choose to go and make a cup of tea or I can sit and watch the ads. There's, there's you know, there's no real difference there. So there's a great esports opportunity. And then games as destination is huge as well. The kind of model that my son, who's nearly 13, the way he plays games is so different to how I play. Yeah. So different. You know, it kind of migrates from spending your life on Minecraft to spending your life in Roblox to spending your life in Fortnite. Yeah. And each time... An entertainment platform. Yeah, and, and the opportunities there are incredible. You know, it, it, talking about brands, but moving a little bit away from advertising, you've had Marshmallow in Fortnite, you've had Lady Gaga in Roblox doing concerts. Yeah. Millions of people. Who, yeah. who would have thought that? And, you yeah. know, so I think yeah, there's, there's amazing technological opportunities. There's amazing ways that, that things can happen. You know, I, I didn't even mention virtual goods, virtual goods. You know, what opportunities are there going to be there? But as long as it's adding value, you know, I think Louis Vuitton was in The Sims, if I remember rightly. And that's all good and well. But just having an opportunity of, you know, generic clothes, generic clothes, generic clothes, Louis Vuitton, it's kind of a little bit stupid. It doesn't, I'm not having a go at that. But, you know, it's got to be a bigger picture where the user has a lot of different choices and a lot of opportunities. But there are amazing opportunities for virtual goods. But as long as it all comes down, in my opinion, to adding value to everybody in the chain, the developers, the end users, the advertisers, everyone's got to win with it. And the only way they can win is people thinking and spending a lot of time and not just kind of, you know, doing this for the sake of it, which is where, you know, the likes of, of AdMix and stuff really come into it because you guys are focused only on getting this right. And, you know, you, it, it's, it's irrelevant whether you're nice people. It's irrelevant whether you're gamers. It's irrelevant whether you care about the gamers. I'm not saying you do or don't, but it's irrelevant. What's relevant is your business model for work, for you to um, fulfill your contract with your employers and, and sorry, employees and, you know, make sure that they have a decent wage and, and, and all the other things like that. You've got to exist as a company. And to exist in a company, you've got to get it right. Because if you don't, mm. you won't exist. So it's the market speaking. In many ways, technology and people's behavior you know, has driven it. But it's ultimately the market speaks. And if the market doesn't want it, people will turn away from those games. So you've got to get it right. Absolutely. Mickey, thank you so much. This was uh, really pleasure. exciting to, to go back and see uh, all the work that you guys have done in the past. True pioneers of the in-game advertising market. Um, before we close off, do you want to do you have uh, anything you wanna you wanna say? Maybe a 
couple of things about Perm Games or where, where can people get a hold of you if they wanted to get in touch? Yeah, I mean, for Perp Games, as I said before, you know, the big focus for us is giving choice. It's giving choice and opportunity for the retailers to have the opportunity to sell product. Because if everything goes digital, physical retailers struggle to exist. And no one really wants that. Um, you know, it's about choice. It's about opportunity. So, you know, we have our channels. We've got our Twitter channel, our Perp Games Twitter channel, our Perp Games YouTube channel, our Perp Games database that you can enroll to on our website. What's really quite interesting, and, and you know, I don't want to use this as a chance to to push us, but I, I do thank you, Sam, for giving us the opportunity. Of course, you can. Um, but we do have our own um, shop. You know, we sell our games through um, traditional retailers, but we have our own shop where we tend to sell um, special editions of things. We get the developers to sign maybe 50 copies um, of something, and then we sell those. We don't charge extra for the developments. Oh, wow. Where, where is the shop? So the, the shop is basically, if you go to Perp Games um, website, so just perpgames.com, and you can click on the store icon at the top. And you go to our shop. So, but if you follow any of our channels, Twitter or YouTube or our database, we constantly let people know um, what new things are coming up. We just, for example, uh, recently announced uh, a game, a VR game called Headmaster. So, again, Headmaster is available in, in retail shops or will be when it's released in a couple of weeks. But on our shop, you get a signed version of it and you get a little mini football, which is quite cool. Um, I might have nice. one, actually. I've got, one. Oh, I've, got, I've, got, I've got one that's not. Not blown up. But I've never actually opened this yet. They only just came yesterday night, so it needs to be blown up. But you get a little, you get a football. And again, there's only ever going to be a few, uh, in fact, 100 ever made of these. Um, and then we we sell. But we we t we tend to sell these extra things at cost. We don't make profit. You know, the profits on the game. So I think if I was going to push anything, I'd say if people like physical and collection editions, then go to our store and, and see what's there. Yeah, yeah. It's almost going all the way back now. People are used to digital, giving them real product as almost a differentiator which is interesting <laughs> all right yeah absolutely all right thank you thank you miki uh, thanks everyone for listening please uh follow up on our channel and i see you guys next week for another episode